1975, Animal Liberation was published. In hindsight, a seminal work of philosophy, marking the birth of the modern animal rights movement, though its author spoke not of rights per se, but, as a utilitarian, in terms, put crudely, of maximising interests or happiness. The Australian author is now at Princeton, and perhaps the world's most famous philosopher. He argues that some animals have a higher moral status than some humans, and that our disregard for animal suffering is a deplorable moral blind spot. He also has contentious views on euthanasia, abortion, on infanticide, on civil disobedience, and on how much we should give to charity. But Ethics Bites spoke to Peter Singer about how humans should treat animals. Peter Singer, welcome to Ethics Bites. Thank you, Nigel. It's good to be with you. Now, the topic we're going to focus on is the ethics of using animals, both in food or as food and in research. Before we start, it's probably best to get clear about what you understand by a person, because you distinguish a person from a human being. What's the difference? A person for me is someone who is aware of their own existence over time, is aware enough to realise that they're the same being who lived previously and who can expect to live into the future. So most human beings are persons, but none of us were born persons. Newborn infants are not persons. And some non-human animals are persons, but not all non-human animals are persons. So what kind of non-human animal might be a person? A chimpanzee, for example, I think is probably aware of its own existence over time. So I think there's good evidence that chimpanzees are persons. And what about adult humans who lack the mental capacity to think about their own past as their own? Would they not be persons? I think they're no longer persons. They may have been persons, and we may wish to respect the wishes that they had when they were persons. But there comes a time, at least, if the body outlives your intellectual capacities to such an extent that you can no longer be aware of your past or even of the idea that you have a future, then you would cease to be a person. Somebody listening to this who's not a philosopher would say, well, look, you can define a person, you can define a human being. So what? Yeah, absolutely. That's quite the right reaction. Definitions don't show anything normatively. But I do think that the idea of a being who can envisage his or her own future is morally significant because if you compare the wrongness of killing a being who is capable of having some anticipation of the future, some desires for the future, perhaps even some projects to complete in the future, and you kill such a person who wants to go on living, you're doing something wrong to that person, which is something that you're not doing if you kill a being who is clearly not a person and who can have no wishes or hopes for the future, and therefore you can't cut off or thwart or frustrate those wishes for the future. So I think the concept of the term person points to something that is relevant in the specific context of the wrongness of killing. See, to me, the issue with animals is whether they suffer or not. All kinds of animals are capable of suffering, even if they don't have a conception of their life continuing. I totally agree. You brought up the topic of persons, not me. I think the major issue about animals and the way we treat them is the fact that they're capable of suffering. I don't think it's about the wrongness of killing them. And it's interesting that many of your critics focus on descriptions of a situation where you're playing off a human being who is less than a person against an animal which is a person. I think that's a tactic. Maybe it's quite an effective tactic with some audiences anyway. They try and say that I think animals in some circumstances deserve more consideration than humans do. It's accurate that there are some situations, though I think they're quite rare ones, where that would be true, where the human was so intellectually disabled or incapable of understanding things that you would want to give preference to the non-human animal that would have greater interests in going on living or not suffering in a certain way. But it's, it's really completely irrelevant to the vast majority of the cases in which we are interfering with animals, that is where we're producing them for food, where obviously they're suffering and it's not at all necessary for me to say that they somehow have the same, let alone a superior status to humans, to just point to the fact that we're inflicting unnecessary suffering on them and that should be enough to make it wrong given that we're not doing this in order to save human lives but just because we like to eat a certain kind of food. Another concept that's important in your work, not just the idea of suffering, but the idea of speciesism, the idea that it's somehow akin to racism to treat other animals, non-human animals, in a way that we wouldn't treat human beings. It's not so much that we're treating animals in a way we wouldn't treat human beings, because sometimes 
that may be appropriate, given that they have different interests, different capacities. Sometimes we should treat them differently, just as we sometimes treat small children differently and should treat them differently from the way we treat older human beings. The point about speciesism is that we give less weight to the interests of beings who are not members of our species simply because they're not members of our species, not looking at their individual characteristics, not looking at their capacities or what's good for them or what's bad for them. But we just say, well, they're not members of the species Homo sapiens. Therefore, we can use them for our purposes, for our ends. We don't have to treat them as if their ends mattered. Whereas if we have a human being, no matter what the mental level of that human being, that human being's life is sacred, that human being is an end in itself, we must respect the dignity of that human being, and so on. That speciesism, to just take the species in itself as determinative of moral status. But isn't that just a good rule of thumb? I mean, when you see another person, you tend to think of them as evolving over time with a sense of themselves and a capacity to feel pain in a way that a fish like a haddock just doesn't. Well, for one thing, not all of our encounters with animals are with headache. For another, while I would agree with the first part of what you said, that the human is certainly likely to have more of a self-conception, more of an awareness of itself as existing over time, I'm not so clear that human beings are going to have a greater capacity to suffer. We know that non-human animals have some senses that are more acute than ours. Eagles have better eyesight. Dogs have a better sense of smell and so on. It's not at all impossible that because of their need to live in sharp contact with the world to evolve, that animals have capacities to feel pain that are just as acute or more acute than ours. We shouldn't take it as a rule of thumb that humans always suffer more than animals, and certainly not that human suffering matters more, which is really the point about speciesism, to say that even where we make no claim that the human does suffer more, nevertheless, the suffering of the human matters more just because it is a human being. Now, the two main ways in which many of us use animals are as food and in some kind of experimentation, possibly for scientific research, possibly researching cosmetics. You're a utilitarian, that is, you're interested in maximising happiness in some sense, or maximising the interests of sentient beings. That's what makes something right or wrong. That's right. Whether all things considered, and in the long run, you've done what's best in the interests of or to satisfy the preferences of all sentient beings. It just complicates everything. Most of us, most of the time, are actually most interested in other human beings. If you start including all kinds of animals, how do you work out what to do? I suppose it does complicate things a bit, just as if you were a, a white European in the 18th century, it probably complicated things to have to consider the interests of Africans, uh, which interferes with your profitable trade in slaves, maybe. But even though it's more complicated, it's still something we ought to do. Now, it is true that the calculations can't be done with any precision at all.